everyone. It's 7 o'clock, and if this is Wednesday night, you're sitting at CPC. We'd like to thank Harbor Media for filming us tonight and tomorrow night. Um, as you know, these uh, evening meetings are broken into half because we have so many applicants coming to us this year that we have this evening and then the same time, same place tomorrow night for the other half of our applicants. Otherwise, people wouldn't have enough time to talk. Um, it's November 14th. This is the first of the two meetings. Everyone ready to go? You have your agendas, your packets. <coughs> We're going to start with a little bit of business and then we'll get to you, all the applicants. I'm going to call for a vote on the minutes for October 17th. Anyone like to make any comments, corrections, changes? You all got these ahead of time? Well, that's a good sign. Perfect. Thank you, Vicki. Anyone second? Where did that come from? Bob Moser. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you all. Um, the next thing on our agenda tonight is some general announcements. As I just told you, we'll be doing half of this tonight, half tomorrow night. Each applicant's limited to about 15 minutes, which includes question time from all of us. And we have our questions ready to go. And then you all come back to us on January 2nd and 3rd, which is your second chance to maybe add more information, change your mind about something, um, and you know, one last push to give us all the information that you think we'll need. So we'll give you a little feedback tonight, and if you can come back to us on one of those two nights, Carol will schedule you in. We'll go through the same process again at that point, and uh, then on the 9th we vote, January 9th. So. Um, there are things like prices of property that need to be settled now before that second round of meetings on January 2nd and 3rd. Okay, and our esteemed vice chair has an announcement. Hi, everybody. So um, just to kind of get you up to speed, we have uh, $646,000 to recommend for spending at town meeting this year, and we have almost $2.5 million in asks. And with that in mind, I uh, went online and I looked up a bunch of um, funding organizations to see where entities in Hingham might go to look for funds to uh, for their preservation projects or their open space projects and even their recreation projects. And I found about a dozen and I typed them up with little explanations. Um, all applicants and anybody in the room actually is welcome to take a copy and Carol Costello will be putting it on the website. And I just think it's important for people to realize that um, CPC's funds are limited. There are so many worthy projects. With the gap between what's asked for and what's available, people are going to walk away unhappy. And I just think it's good to be resourceful and um, look at other avenues for, for grants and for funding. And that's why I came up with this. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's a way to start thinking about, gee, where else could I go to get money to help pay for my really good project? So I hope people will take advantage of this. And we will get that on our website pretty quickly. We wanted to get it out first to you all tonight and the group tomorrow night, and then it will eventually show up on our website. And we can add to it over the years and take away from it, but it means when you come to us to look for funding, we'll give you some other options. It doesn't mean don't don't apply. It just means you might consider some others also. Mm -hmm. And as, as Larry said, the uh, the original ask for this year was over $5 million. And um, when we take out what we have to uh, pay the bank for the Heritage Museum and the Laner property, it brings us down to 646000 this year total to give out or to recommend to give out. So you can see what the problem was. Now, one of the big ones, of course, was the swimming pool, won a several million dollar commitment over time. They're going to hold up a year, regroup, and come back to us probably next year. Um, but it's still... It's still a lot of funding. It's over $2 million. It's about a three-to-one ratio. So if we can't, um, what we'll be asking each one of you is, um, if we can't give you your total amount, would part of it help you? 
um, and what would you do in that case? Um, and another question will be, if we can't help you at all, do you have other sources, or would waiting a year make a difference to you? And you'll understand that when you think about the numbers we have in front of us. It could be that um, organizations that regularly, routinely get funding from us maybe have to skip a year. Um, others that are very hopeful might have to come back to us for the second half of it another year, that sort of thing. So. Um, are there any questions on that part of it? We have a budget in front of us that Carol updates every month, and um, there have been a few changes. As you'll hear as we go through the, the applicants tonight, a few have been able to lower their ask. A few, we don't know the total amount that they're going to be asking yet. It's still being determined. Um, and some have dropped out, sometimes because they weren't ready for us. Sometimes they found out they did not have permission to use the site um, that they had hoped to use, um, and others just thought they weren't, you know, weren't ready for us yet. They'll come back next year. So it's gotten down to two hundred, two million four hundred and sixty-three. That's be still being asked for our six hundred thousand. So that's our deal. Um, I guess unless anybody wants to wait a little bit, we were going to start at 7.15, but I, I think we're okay to get started. Is that, is that all right? Okay, our first group is Conservation of Historic Records. I see Andrea Young in front of us, so I know we're ready to go. administrator for the Historic Districts Commission and the Historical Commission. And tonight um, I'm presenting a proposal for the treatment and conservation of historic records. And thanks to um, past grants from CPC, we've been able to um, treat and conserve in nice fashion so that they're usable again, many of the books and ledgers that are in the town clerk's office. So these, however, um, the books I'm going to talk about tonight are located in the vault at the library. And uh, so they've been there for a number of years. I want to um, <clears throat> make one thing clear at the outset, that these books... Um, although the dates on the bindings, as you'll see in the presentation, are um, the very early years of the town, um, they weren't published at that time. These are, these are copies of records um, that were ordered by, if you don't mind my reading, um, by a resolve of the legislature of the Commonwealth, approved March 10th, 1837, the governor was authorized to procure the publication of the journals of each provincial congress of Massachusetts and of such papers connected with those records as would illustrate the patriotic exertions of the people of the state in the revolutionary contest. Um, and by doing so, the objective was to perpetuate and multiply copies of these memorials of the history of that period when the authority of the crown had been overthrown and the powers of government were exercised by people in their primary assemblies. So it was Benjamin Lincoln Esquire, the clerk, who um, 
<coughs> was responsible for consolidating these records and getting them ready to be published. What happened, um, apparently, I, I was interested to find that there were so many original documents um, from the period before the Revolutionary War that were um, given to the members of the Continental Congress at the time, and um, they took them to their homes, um, but were not, <clears throat> were not saved. Um, a lot of the reason is because when the British attacked Concord and Lexington, um, it was a surprise siege in the Siege of Boston that they destroyed many of the records because they were records of their um, military capability and their um, their assets and uh, weapons and so forth. So those things were destroyed so that they couldn't get into enemy hands. So here we are, and I will um, get started going through what we have in the library. It's a um, it's a wonderful compilation of material. Okay, so just to give you a little background, the documents documents are historic resources. In 2006, the CPA statute was amended to include documents and artifacts as historic resources, and allowable projects include restoration, conservation, archival storage, and improvements to storage systems. And as we know, preserved documents provide the future with an understanding of the past. The existing conditions of the books that we are discussing, and there are approximately 30 volumes, are all in, in very poor shape. Um, the exterior, the covers are torn, the bindings are unstable, the, a lot of the covers are leather, so they dried out over time. Um, pages are discolored due to age, material degradation, uh, mildew stains, and the like. The, um, the pages are torn loose um, and from overuse, and so they're not stable in the bindings any longer in a lot of the volumes. And they're currently st stored, as I said, in the library vault. So here are um, some of the volumes of the Acts and Resolves of the province of Massachusetts. And so I, I tried to put them in order. I guess I, there were some of them that were missing. So I'll have to hunt those down. But nevertheless, there they are. Um, and the Acts... Um, you can probably see it better if you look at your um, the document that I have in front of you. Um, I just it was fascinating to sit there and, and go through these things because uh, they they just told us so much. But this is uh, a, just a sample page. Um, the acts passed at the session begun and held at Boston on the 14th day of February, A.D., 1693 to 1694. And chapter 17 particularly talks about an act for the better rule and government of the Indians in their several places and plantations. Chapter 18, which is on the leaf to the right, um, is an act for the relief of idiots and distracted persons, and I count myself in that. <laughs> so, um, but no, it, it was a very important act because it really did, um, it really did provide for um, people who were unable to care for themselves and had no family um, to help them out. So, okay. Um, so this is the this is a title page from one of them, and as you can see below, that it's um, 1838, I think it said um, that this this was prepared. And uh, this journal reflects the names of those who were um, assigned to this uh, Congress at the time. Let me just find it. I can't read it from here either. But you'll see that Benjamin Lincoln represented Hingham. So, in a, 
Uh, in essence, what we're trying to do is um, there were a number of volumes there um, of varying kinds. and But what we did was to go through and triage what was there so that um, we, we took the 30 most in need. And so the process will be to assess each volume, to determine the type and extent of the treatment required, to photograph each volume before and after treatment, which we've done in the past, and to treat each volume to restore it <clears throat> to the extent possible and to stabilize its after-treatment condition. We will also be wrapping the conserved volumes in archival tissue, and they will be stored in archival boxes, and um, the town clerk, Eileen, has been gracious enough to say that she'll make room for them downstairs. So that access will be easy. Right now, you can't get at them. <clears throat> so the project timeline um, will be after town meeting, assuming that this project is moving forward and is approved. Um, and I've, I've put down the fiscal year, but I think that uh, you've seen in, in past work that the conservator, who we have working on these documents, um, does so in fairly rapid fashion. So um, what will be required of him will be a condition assessment, written condition assessment for each of 30 volumes, before and after photographs, a completion report for each volume as the treatment is finished, and we will, he's very good about um, checking in periodically. So, and here the project costs. He estimates, um, I took the high end of his estimate, at 9750 to treat and conserve the 30 volumes. Um, and then looking at past receipts for archival boxes, I calculated about $390 to purchase large boxes um, for these books. Um, and uh, archival tissue at $39.98 um, per is uh, a total of about $80. There is no tax, of course, and shipping and processing is about $35. So the total um, ask is $10,254.98. So that's it. <coughs> You're welcome. Questions? Yes. Um, we've been doing this for many years with you now. Yes. And uh, where do you stand on last year's phrase? Oh, they're all finished. Now? Nope, they're done. They're done. Everything's right. done. So everything that we put in the account for you has been used up? That is correct. And again, for the second time, we've returned um, a few dollars. About 500 I think, Carol, if I remember correctly. Jim? Will the books be available for research? Oh, yes. Or, or will the copies be available? Yes. Yeah, they are. That would be the intent to get them out of the um, the vault where nobody can see them now. And uh, so, so people who need the information will know that it's available. Yes. Okay. I know that you said these are in the library, not in your office, not in. Your that office. is correct. These are in the library vault. Are they? They're all owned by the town. That's right. Yes, they are town documents. That is correct. And this 30 for this year is like as fast as your archivist can? Yeah, I think he, he, um, he committed to being able to complete 30 volumes this year, and my guess is that he'll do it in, in less than a year. Yeah, and you're satisfied with his work? Yes, we are. And Eileen, um, Eileen McCracken and I both um, review his work and look at the, we know what they look like before, and we see them when they come back. and. They're in usable form, and that's that's our primary concern. And everyone gets before and after photos. That is correct. Yeah, the logging. Yes, and, and bound in, a, in the same format as the uh, actual books, the before and afters. Uh, no, I'm sorry. They are separate photographs. But so I mean, they're are they, are they then bound? Or, no, or they're, they're just they are part. separate photographs that I turn into Carol, and we've worked out something else because um, he has a tendency to give us photographs that are um, actual photographs. So Carol is running out of room and I have committed to making sure that we get them um, digitized. You have them digitally in your computer? 
copies. That's a good project for us. Mm-hmm. That's a good project for someone, yes. Yeah. Well, really, you made a really good point. Researchers will have access to the actual books if necessary. Yeah. That is correct. These books um, published in the 1800s that are located in the library will become accessible to uh, through the town clerk's office. No, I sort of identify with that because I did a thesis on some legislation in Massachusetts from the last century, or the one before, oh. 1900s, mm-hmm. 1800s. And they went to the Action Resolves at the BPL, and, and they looked just like that, you know, the same kind of binding on all the shelf. And most weren't touched most of the time, but having the actual book there is very gratifying. It, it, it is. The fact that they'll be in shape to, to tolerate being used is mm-hmm. very good to hear. Yes. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure there are some somewhere. I don't know, though. I was just looking at ours, so sorry I don't have the answer to that. I'm sure the Boston Public Library, I know, has copies of these items as well, as Jim said, and I saw them online. And he determines the price of each one based on what he has to do. That is correct. Any? We all speak that, or any good questions? Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, now we're in a pickle. Should we all sing for a while? Oh. Community. We're ahead of ourselves, but we do know the Bell Tower people are here. So, do you want to get started, even though we're a little early? Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Everybody have the new materials that they just gave us tonight? I should mention that I was the alleged project manager for this. It was something like, Andrew, you, you, there's not much managing to be done. I was saying nice things about you. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I was the... I was a technical formal project manager, but you did all the work. How lovely he looks. He looks the most. <laughs> okay, you want to introduce yourselves and get started? Sure. I'm Martha Ryan from the Hingham Memorial Bell Tower Committee. And I'm Daniel Cushing. I am the teacher at the Memorial Bell Tower. Welcome back. Thank we, you. We've seen you once or twice before. Absolutely. It's nice to be back. <laughs> I went to school in this room. <laughs> Um, so, I imagine a lot of you have seen this before, or good portions of it, um, but just an overview for those of you who haven't, the bell tower was, um, the bells were cast in 1911, and the bell tower was uh, dedicated in 1912 to the first settlers of Hingham. Uh, the bells are really magnificent. If you've never been down to see them and to climb all the way up into the belfry, I know that's a real commitment to the bell tower. Um, but it's really uh, very, um, they're very dramatic, and they're each um, inscribed with uh, these messages, which are replicas from bells um, that are located around Hingham, England. Right? I thought you could do a little description of what change bell ringing is? Sure. Um, There are 10 bells set for change ringing in this bell tower. And change ringing is, uh, the the bells are tuned on a scale from the highest to the lowest note. Uh, So it's a recognizable scale. But the way we ring the bells is that they swing in a full circle and they strike once in each circle. So when we pull on the rope, the rope, the bell is upside down. It swings in a full circle, strikes on the way up kind of right where it hits, uh, uh, approaches the louvers, so the sound gets thrown out the louvers, and then comes comes back up to set at the upside-down position, and then it swings back the other way. So it sounds uh, once on each, each, each pull of the rope. So you can't really ring tunes on those bells because it's, the timing's just wrong. So the, what they figured out in the 14 and 1500s in England was that you could do, uh, do permutations of them. So you just kind of change the order that the bells are rung in. And, of course, any time you start putting order into it, you, there, you, people start writing it down and coming up with methods. We call them methods. They're, they're compositions. But, so there's, a, there's an actual set pattern, and what you do is you memorize the pattern. 
So it doesn't matter what bell you're ringing on, whether you're the first bell or the last bell or a bell in the middle, you know which direction you're going in, you know what the pattern is. And so it's a kind of a syncopated sound. Um, but the aim is that you don't ring the same combination twice in, in, a, in a set ring. So each time you pull the rope, the bells are rung in a different order, and it's set to come back to ringing down the scale when you're, when you're done with that particular method. Uh, there are many, uh, there are many um, um, variants of that, and you can extend it for hours if you're so inclined. I've been ringing for over 45 years, and I've gone as far as 45 minutes, and that's enough for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. It's, yeah. So uh, the bells are in. Uh, so, so the bells get a fair amount of work. They get a good workout, um, and they're big bells. Uh, the largest bell is 2,200 pounds, and the lightest bell is 550 pounds. So, and it stands about this high. Um, I remember going up there with Sydney McCullough, and we just popped up there, and it just we. I don't know what came across us, but they were like whales up there. You know, they're just so big and so gentle looking, and they're just, <laughs> they're behemoths in that tower. And they're magnificent bells. The castings on them are just incredible, like nothing I've ever seen, mainly because they are, the castings are actually copies of bells in England, England that they would have heard, as Martha mentioned. They're really lovely. And um, so this is what we've been up to the past year. Um, there have been, uh, again, guest ringers that come from uh, England, and they do uh, really bus tours across the, the country and, and do this sort of incredible uh, journey from tower to tower. Uh, that's the photo of them underneath, of the group that came uh, this past year. We leave the front door open when we ring, so often people come up from, you know, either in town or around town. We had two notable visitors, which were just kind of fun stories. Um, one was somebody who had come to look in the cemetery and was um, looking for his Cushing relatives. And he found them. I was so excited <laughs> because he came up to the tower. I said, I found your Cushing relative, and we were really able great. to connect him with Dan. Yeah. And he was so excited was really to meet another fun. Cushing up in the bell yeah. tower. Um, which was really fun. And the other um, family that came up, which was just, you know, it's just so um, really special, was from the Hobart family. And again, had come, you know, the um, Peter Hobart is, uh, you know, a contributor to the tower. There's a Hobart room. This woman had come to the tower before and it um, was closed. She came, she was thrilled that it was open. Um, her family helped her from her wheelchair into the Hobart room. And, um, you know, we didn't know really anything about it, but, you know, asking her about why she was there, and she was just so thrilled, and she said it was the most special day of her life to be there. Yeah. So it was just really yeah. very moving. So. And while that was going on, we were upstairs ringing, so it was kind of neat. It yeah, was it was just, a, fun, yeah. a fun day. So those were two special um, visits this year. Um, we've hosted uh, the Bell Guild. We've had people from Boston uh, and New England areas come twice now this, this year. Which again, it's just fun to have new people ring the bells. And just this past weekend, um, the tower participated in the Bells of Peace, which uh, you know around the world rang in celebration for the um, centennial uh, of the armistice that brought the end of World War One. So that's what's new at the <laughs> bell tower. Oh. So just a little bit of a background um, of the work that's been done, and I'll. I won't read every word, but in 2013, there was a really significant project to stabilize the tower um, that, uh, you know, they changed the, the floors, they put in steel supports. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a lengthy and significant project. Um, this past year, we did, we did get funds from the CPC of the last cycle to fund two bells, six and eight, which has been great. And then we also, um, at the CPC recommendation, went to look for other funds and were awarded two bells uh, through the Greenbush Award. Um, so we combined those two funds and worked with um, the Foundry to create one contract to do those four bells. Um, this grant also includes funding for necessary rope work. So we're working with the new foundry, um, the uh, Ben Sunderland and his foundry, uh, in working with him and trying to understand what the work means. It's very specialized work. It's, I've learned more about um, bell engineering than I ever thought I would. 
They've come in, they've done a lot of very precise measurements. Um, he's gotten consultation about how to bridge, um, you know, one of the things doing it piece by piece is bridging the old bearings with the new bearings. So an enclosed system is a little bigger than the current open system. And so they have to put in plates and, you know, adaptations um, and that type of thing. And we were talking about, well, you know, the goal of all of this, um, from our point of view, <laughs> is to make the bells easier to ring. So the bells in this tower are really a joy, and they're magnificent, but they are incredibly hard to ring. So learning the methods, which are very difficult, um, is only half of the task in that tower, because trying to, to get control of your rope and the bell is very, very challenging. Um, so Ben had recommended um, a budget of $30,000 to address the rope work. So that's how the ropes, you know, how they go through pivot points and how they drop through the floor and where they drop through the floor so that once the bearings are in, that if they're still challenging, that that, that would um, address the final issue of ringability in the tower. So um, that's why that's it. And, and there they are. That's that, that's how that's how they work. Um, the, I told you that the bells balance upside down. You'll see on the on the uh, the, the, the the piece to the right. You, you see a, a thing called a stay. It basically it looks like a two by four. It's a little thicker than that. And down underneath the bell, you see a curved piece of wood. It's also about the size of a two by four. And that slides back and forth. It's called oddly enough a slider. The English are really good with their terms. Um, it's on a on a set. It has a set path uh, back and forth, and the stay hits the slider, pushes it against a stop, and then the bell balances upside down. You have to stop it first, but it balances upside down, and then it swings the other way and it pushes the, the, the uh, slider over to the other side. But when you see gudgeon and bearing um, to the uh, right above the uh, kind of orange bars there on the on the frame, that is what's what the problem is. Those are basically steel and you know, steel bearings in a cast iron cup it's 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 literally just a, a, a shaft in a cup they've been in there since 1912 uh, there's a cover on them but the covers have cracked they're cast iron um, there's no heat up there um, I think yeah we may have some close-ups you can see the bells are really tucked in there we go that's the, that's the yeah so if you see the kind of a, a flared piece in the center and then there's there's a kind of a I guess I can back up there. Uh, so there's a piece right here. This is the piece that's That's the bearing that swings the bell. And what we want to do is replace those. What we need to do is replace those with um, enclosed ball bearing uh, 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 bearings, so that they uh, don't get dust in them. They don't crack. They don't. They're not exposed to the weather. Um, they are. Um, easily maintained. They just need there's, a, there's an oiling regimen that you can do, and it's all set out. Um, so that's kind of what will make the bells. That's the that's the primary piece that will make the bells more ringable. Also, um, that we're going to get the clappers replaced. The clappers are there since 1912, um, and these headstocks need to be replaced because they just don't. It's the way the the bearings fit into the headstocks and then into the bearing covers. So they don't, the, the old bearing, the old headstocks just don't fit. So they, they're going to put in newer headstocks. And the wheels, that wheel was built in 1912. It's, we think it's made of elm. It's remarkable that it's still in great shape. Um, it's, but they are, we are experiencing cracks. We can repair them, but it's getting to the point where we're running out of ability to kind of maintain the bells. Uh, in ringing order. This is what kind of closer to what they would look like. You can see that the bearings are very are enclosed, um, just just under the red headstocks. Um, that will this will, and, and we're going to get new wheels as well. Uh, it will certainly make them. They'll hang truer. They'll ring smoother. Um, and then and what um, Martha was talking about the rope work. We'll just make sure that the ropes hang properly for the new hanging. Um, there might be tweaks that are necessary. That's why. That's why he had thrown that in there. He did he, expectation management. Well, I think he was doing. Plans to uh, save the worn out old hundred year old parts and display them or something. I I so hope it, so. I Make them into a mobile. Or? We, we <laughs> brought huge. that to the historic commission to talk about, and um, I, 
I think, if I understand it correctly, is that um, one one of the sets will go to uh, the foundry. They're interested in using it as a teaching tool of what before looks like. Um, and that the, I think the Historic Commission is interested in keeping um, the parts and making a decision about what to do with them, especially the wheels are just kind of cool. So. Yeah, or something, just as people come in and yeah, so that's, the that's I think up to the historic commission, and, yeah. and I'm not sure where that would happen. But um, even if they're not in the tower, I think they're worth save, worth saving one or two. I agree with you because they are the craftsmanship is amazing. I mean, they're big, though, they're huge. and they're heavy. <laughs> I mean, those headstocks are hundreds of pounds. So. Oh yeah, but there is one that says "Mirrors in London" on it, and it's just very it's kind of dramatic. And I think we should save that one. That's I've got it all picked up. <laughs> now, if anybody will take it, that's a good thing. But for the mobile, for the mobile, yeah, right. Oh my goodness! But uh, so, the end result will be um, an instrument that can ring, where all the bells can ring in concert with each other. Um, we we're fixing the two worst bells right now. Um, six and eight are six. I don't know what's. Up with six, it has always been a bear. Um, the guy who taught me to ring, Gene Gardner, was um, a, a bear of a man, and he was the only one in the tower who could ring it when I was growing up. Um, eight is right under a window, so it's just those bearings have taken taken a beating. So we chose those two, but when those are done, the rest of the bells will ring differently than they do, or they will ring differently from the rest of the bells. So what we're hoping to do is just restore the instrument. It's one of, I don't remember how many rings of 10 there are in North America, but there are very few. And this, I think, might be the oldest. Um, and it's just, it's a remarkable ring of bells. Um, so we, that's, that's what we're here for. We just want to have kind of the final restoration of these bells. Um, they should last another 100 years, I hope. I, I, I don't think any of us will, will, be, uh, will be meeting, meeting, meeting about uh, having them done again. But uh, the, the tower is in great shape. The frame is in very good shape. You know, Mr. Sunderland decided to, he said that he could work with the existing frame. You know, ideally we might have put in a new frame, but it was fine. It's, they, they use good materials and the tower is well built. So it's just a matter of restoring the instrument. Yeah, and they've already started on the, the two that we've they haven't. So, no, we, no. we um, combined the CPC and the Greenbush funds, so there's actually four bells that are contracted for. Um, they've done the measurements. Um, they're finalizing the contract with the foundry, and um, the foundry anticipates that with the additional bells, so the first two bells would have been able to be done sooner, but in order to cast and do all the work on the four bells, he was thinking probably um, like February, March, like early spring. So that's when we're um, anticipating. Would you then wait the until April to see if you get funded for the rest of well, for the rest of the bells? Uh, I don't think we would do it all. I don't know if we would I do it all would together. Be up to ben. I th yeah, I think our intention was to go ahead with the the four bells and to have those done. You know, those are funded to go forward with that, and then to have the remaining bells done. We talked at one point yeah. about saving money on the crane if you only have to do it once. If you only right. had to do it once, I mean that would yeah. be true. I I. You I can check I'd with the schedule. I mean, I yeah, could, I mean I, it's it's a possibility. I would yeah. just be concerned about. I, I'm not, and you know more about this than I do about the ex, when the money expires for Greenbush or we have two years. We have two okay years. For the, I'm for just Greenbush thinking if it's state. going to be February, or March, and April is town meeting, and you yeah. might know then that you have the whole thing if they vote for yeah, it. Yeah, we could we could do that. You know, it would Save take time for him to do all of the the work associated mm -hmm. with it. But if he could wait another eight months, he could certainly do the installation at one time. And I think that would be it. it would be less. Like, less expensive because mm -hmm. of the crane yes, rentals. Right. And some of the um, just discussions about how to mount the old bells next to the new bells are sound very complicated. <laughs> well, he, he makes it sound complicated. Like, he's really had to research it. So I, I, I'm sure that would well, make it a little taking easier. taking them out of, lifting them up and taking all the parts out without taking the bells out of the tower. So mm -hmm. he's going to crib the base of where the bells hang and he's going to lower them onto that mm -hmm. while he fashions the the the, the, um, 
the, the bearings onto the onto the new frame, and then I guess he's going to put the new head hoist it back up, put the headstock on them, and then lower it into the bearings. So there's quite a bit of engineering going on. And again, uh, the biggest one's over two tons, or two exactly, tons. it's huge. It's, it's it's I can it it towers over me when I stand on it. So it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful bell. I think I can answer the next <laughs> question that we have to ask everyone, and yeah. that is, if we don't get funded this year, right. it sounds to me like you'll do the first four. After the holidays or February, March or something. Right. Yeah, and then come back for Yeah. Yeah, I have just one question. Um, and this is an applause because compared to last year's presentation, I'm hearing a lot more of detail as to what they're doing to the bells. Ah. I mean, amazing detail in this, which is a great thing. So I'm wondering, after getting funding, was he? were you able to get more information about the different... Um, elements that needed to be replaced and is it possible that once the work starts to get done I mean as you said these are very heavy bells is there a potential for things that he is not assuming or that they could you know one way or the other it could either be more expensive or maybe not as bad I mean obviously there are 10 bells and they're now taking a much closer look at least from what I'm hearing tonight we're getting a lot more information than we had last year so good for you for doing the work today so that we really have um, knowledge as to what needs to be done but is that possible that so he's giving you a guesstimate or is it uh no I mean he's been to the yeah. tower several times they've done very precise measurements I mean this is not White Chapel that was mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years old this is a young man who's starting his business mm -hmm. um I, I, th I suppose it's possible that something I, could come up but I don't I don't know how to answer yeah. about the you know what could come up um but, well, I mean, less yeah. expensive, obviously, is good, too. I, I don't necessarily, I mean, the question we have, though, is if it is more expensive, I mean, are there other ways, to, uh, you know, would it stop in its tracks of going forward? Um, and then, obviously, if, if don't get funded this year, um, does that prevent the first four bells from in any way being done? And is it possible that some other thing could be uncovered during some of that work? That you wouldn't know I think now. Like with any construction project, once you open something up, well, there that's are my problems. Point. Um, but I, there's not a lot of nooks and crannies up there. He's been in every corner of it. Um, I think his quote is pretty sound. Um, I've read it, and it, it's really just the component parts and the labor. Um, they're not doing anything structural, so it's not as if they're doing brickwork, or they're not going to find that they're going to need to restore anything. Um, there are plates that he's going to put on the frame, but it's just so that he can secure the new pieces. So I think he's thought that out as well. I didn't think about that. There's There are uh, two bells that are next to each other, and they actually share a space on the frame, and the size of the bearings are different than the current bearings, and he's taken that into account, and he's tried to figure out how to make them live next door to each other. Uh, so he's, he's really, I, I think he's done a great job. I think he's also highly invested in having this be a success. Um, he is also bringing in, part of his quote was, he's having a, a, um, his, his mentor, the person who taught him in England, to uh, be there Sorry, to help out. Final question, has he given you any indication that it, the optimum situation would be to be able to do all the bells at the same time? I mean, because you talked oh. about hanging them, so the optimist. Yes. I'm sure that would be his preference. Oh, yeah. 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 He, 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 he wants to get this done as much as we do, I think. <laughs> um, and I would say, too, just because it's a town-owned building, there's a 15% um, buffer on right. that. Yeah. So if there's unexpected costs with the project, that that is designed to allow to for that. that. Great. Thank you. Any last questions? In in our band, yeah. I think we have eight to ten. How many are Hingham residents? Nine. <laughs> Dan is from Boston. I'm the ringer. Right. <laughs> how, how, often, how often do the bills get rung? Outside, outside of the, you ring them weekly, but but for what other events during the year do they get rung? Fourth of July. Um, Fourth of July, we've done uh, weddings. Day. Veterans Day, right? we do weddings. Veterans Day. Um, the yeah. funeral, we do funerals. Uh, the, funerals. The, the square, the, fa the fair in the square. Uh, what's that called? <laughs> the the Christmas. Ho holiday, Christmas. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I think it's a good one. Um, if we are unable, to, if we are unable to 
sorry. Oops, sorry. If we are unable to fund the full amount um, at this next town meeting, do you have an opportunity to go back to, and would you go back to the green bush? Is there an opportunity for more money available for you there? Um, I, we could always go and ask. It's certainly an option. Okay. Are they funding the smaller bills? They're funding this two. Well, that's a good point. I, there was a lot of back and forth at the Green Bush. You know, I, similar situation, I'm sure, where there's a lot of worthy causes. Um, they gave us much less than we asked for. Mm -hmm. We were able to fund the two smallest bells, okay. so the two least expensive. So, you know, as we go through that, the other ones would be more more expensive. Yeah, they're, around 25, mm -hmm. they're looking for 121 so right. that would be little drips and drabs. I know we need to move on, but okay. again, I just want to point out that right in front of you are about a dozen organizations that you could be looking into. Uh, it, it's not just CPC and the Greenbush Fund. There's yeah, thank you lots of much. places. And can I add just one more thing about who, who rings these bells? There are it, they're actually quite sought after by bell ringers. So people come from, as we said, you saw people from England and people around the country. They do love to come ring these bells. Because of the way they sound. Uh, speaking. <laughs> when the town uh, funded the uh, the restructuring of the building, or whatever, strengthening of the building, and that cost close to a quarter of a million bucks, the idea was at that time that the town or the CPC agreed that they would go ahead and do a complete remake of the bells. That was part of it. And the proposal coming from Whitechapel at that time was over half a million dollars. Right? And so at that point, is that 10 years ago? How many years ago that was? I'm not sure. Uh, there was that kind of a commitment. We have now scaled that way, way back. And so I hope everybody understands that we're what we're asking for now is just a pittance of what was agreed on 10 years ago or something like that. Thank and, you. That's, uh, that's an interesting And point. so we, we, the bells were going to be taken out of the tower, hauled back to London, retuned, a new frame built, a whole bunch of stuff. And, and so we've given a lot of thought to this. And so we have uh, really scaled back uh, what we're asking for. Mr. To do Glenn, this. are you going to point to? I'll be very, very brief. Good to see you all again. I just wanted to uh, bring back some history with this. Um, last spring, when I was going off the committee, um, some of you, I hope, will recall that we had this sort of knotty problem at the end of our dis discussion of how to divide up what was left of the money. And I think we came within five minutes of authorizing all the bells last spring. And I think it was Bill who came up with the Missouri Compromise uh, to take a chunk of that money out of that and put it into the uh, affordable housing and all of that. And uh, I wanted to remind everybody of that, that uh, my vote for one turned on the understanding that this was going to get taken care of this year. And the second point I'd make very briefly is that as now a member of the Historical Commission, um, we did authorize $18,000 out of Greenbush for this uh, a few months ago. And I was reluctant to do that. I had to really be talked into that because I said, well, look, you know, the CPC has already, you know, made it clear that they intend to fund this thing. So they had to pull that $18,000 out of me there. And uh, I think it's a great pro I'm not going to talk about the merits. You've heard all that. But I just wanted to remind everybody of the legislative history and how the sausage got made the last time. I just need to make, I'm, I'm very sorry, I need to make one clarification, not just for the people in this room, but for the people at home. We did not, CPC did not say last year that we intended to take care of it this year. We said that we would be inclined to look favorably upon 
a, a new application in the, future. in the future with the understanding that we just didn't know what the other asks were going to be. So there shouldn't be any assumption in the town that CPC decided that not being able to fully take care of it last year, we were definitely going to take care of it this year. That promise was not implied. Uh, no promise was made, but a commitment was made and an understanding was reached that that was going to get done. Thank you. No, no, no. A commitment to look favorably upon the application, not to get it done. Time out. Uh, we started out 10 minutes early. Now we're 15 minutes behind. So we'll go on to the next one, which is the Major General Benjamin Lincoln Park. Bill Ramsey, thanks for joining us. I have uh, some updates here, so Carol, I gave you two. Yes, thank you. Is Alex joining you tonight? Uh, he's not. No. I'm sure he's watching it all. You're all loaded. Good one. It's okay. Uh, yeah, do you mind? I don't want to. talking double time I'll, I'll be quick i'll be quick uh well good evening uh, my name is bill ramsey i live at 55 north street in hingham and i'm here to very excited to talk to you tonight about a proposal to construct a park and um statute to uh major general benjamin lincoln tonight my focus is going to be on the park so let's start off by talking about who the applicant team is um so myself and alec mcmillan are the proponents everybody knows alec as the town historian uh, the historical uh, commission, I listed them as well as they are the, the, the um, appointed board who we are routing our request through. Very lucky to be working with local architect uh, Sevi Strekolovsky. A lot of experience with projects of this nature. And we also have on our team Susan Lowry. Susan Lowry is a nationally acclaimed sculptress. Um, she is known in town for having um, sculpted the uh, statute at the library that everybody likes so much and also she uh, worked on the statute um, at St. Paul's and she recently uh, recently uh, did the bus for uh, Medal of Honor recipient Herbert Foss at the intermodal station she's done work across the country so we're lucky we have a good team together so let me talk to you a little about the proposal what the history of it is and some background to, to uh, give you an overview of what, what, what I'm trying to do tonight and what I'd ask of the committee so for many years, residents of the town have been discussing um, a park and accompanying statue to honor um, what I would submit to you as Hingham's most uh, famous resident, Major General Benjamin Lincoln. Lincoln is known for having received Cornwallis' sword of surrender during the Revolutionary War at Yorktown. But I would uh, submit to you he was very involved with the town of Hingham, serving as a selectman, uh, clerk. Andrea spoke of him already tonight. Um, he was uh, lieutenant governor of the Commonwealth, also was in charge of the Port Authority um, you know, when it was first initiated. Um, and I would submit to you that he really encompasses Hingham's sense of service uh, to, to, his, to our country, to our uh, state, and to our community. So in the past, this has been discussed for many years, in the past obstacles have involved, you know, finding a suitable location to place this park and statue. Funding uh, is a hurdle. And with anything in town that generates a lot of enthusiasm and interest, consensus is always difficult to, to put together in terms of, you know, where it's going to be, what's he going to be doing, is he going to be sitting, standing, things like that. So um, this current initiative was kind of born through um, uh, a Facebook discussion between Alec and I on the Hingham Then and Now Facebook page, um, where he talked about a potential statute to Benjamin Lincoln. And um, the next morning, I emailed him and said, hey, you know, are you serious about doing this? And he said, yeah, please call me. So I called him and he said, yeah, let's do it. You know, this is something that's been talked about in town and let's um, – take some initiative and try to get this done. So a week later, we were on the phone with Susan Lowry, and Susan um, was down in Florida, but she enthusiastically jumped on to our uh, concept. 
And in the spring, we proposed it to the historical commission. Uh, the historical commission um, was very enthusiastic with the idea and voted unanimously to support uh, going forward with it. And in the spring, we took a sidewalk um, with uh, the historical commission, myself, Alec, uh, Paul Haley of the Board of Selectmen. We walked around downtown trying to find a good location for it. So that's where we are in terms of the, uh, the overview of our, our, um, of our project. So this is what the proposed location we are looking at. This is what is going to be uh, hopefully um, constructed at 6 Station Street, which is the old settled class property um, in downtown Hingham. You can see the statue kind of on the right-hand side standing up uh, where, the, where the designated park area is going to be. The way that this location kind of came to be was um, I was discussing with, uh, with the applicant developer about this project and also with SEVI, um, and I noted that they had a park area designated within their layout. So I said to them, hey, would, would you be amenable to the idea of, of a park um, dedicated to Benjamin Lincoln and, and a statue? to Benjamin Lincoln, and they were enthusiastically on board uh, almost immediately that this was a great idea and this was something that they would like to do. I want to make it clear to the committee that the, the applicant developer does not yet own this site. Uh, he, he will not own it until all of the permitting is approved by the town. Um, he's f through the first hurdle with the Historic District Commission certificate. He's moving forward with other permitting boards. But the applicant, I want to make that clear, he doesn't own the property yet, but it is anticipated that he will. Um, and also, he also wanted me to make clear that if, if the park was in some way to encumber his project dollars, he wouldn't go for it. But he is 100% committed to trying to make this happen and very enthusiastic about the idea. So what am I asking the committee for? So here's my, my breakdown and um, att attached to my, um, um, my presentation are quotes. So um, my total request tonight is for $28,325. I, I fully aware of the, um, the limitations you have on your funds. So I have significantly reduced it. This is a very, very conservative estimate. And as you'll see by some of the, the um, quotes I've gotten from contractors and on the plaques and all of the other material, I've reduced it significantly to something that I think I would hope you would be able to support and um, reduce it by almost $70,000. Looking for um, uh, a 500 square foot area of brick with concrete foundation. Um, the concrete foundation would be needed to support the, the statute itself. The statute is going to be uh, several tons, obviously. Um, concrete or granite statute base, that would be the base to support the actual statute. Uh, three bronze plaques, which I'll get into a little more detail. Uh, and granite boulders to mount the plaques and uh, two benches to fill out the park. So here's a breakdown of each uh, specific line item. Um, the 500 square foot area of brick, as I talked about earlier, all of the contracts I've talked to, I've spoke with uh, about 10 contractors on the phone um, over the past couple of weeks who do this kind of work. Each one of them said that obviously the concrete foundation would be needed to support something of this nature, given its, given its weight. A uh, 500 square foot area is not a, not a significantly large area, but I think it's an area that would be uh, would fulfill our objectives in creating this park and honoring him with a statute. Um, again, a conservative estimate I got, 55 square yards, $200 would be a total of $11,000. Next line item would be a concrete or granite statute base. Um, I spoke with... Um, not only with uh, Mrs. Lowry, but also with uh, Amante Granite uh, out of Quincy. They mentioned that the, the base would need to be concrete, and they talked about a granite, uh, and co a granite covering to it uh, for uh, the statue. Um, what I would like to do, I would, I would like to have this park tell a story, uh, a story of service. Um, so I'm asking for three cast bronze plaques. I have the quotes attached to it. And I, um, that one, one plaque would document Lincoln's service to our country. Another plaque would document Lincoln's service to our commonwealth. And the third would document or detail his, his service to our, to our community or town. So th this was the quote given to me for the plaques. You know, it's important to me, given the lo proposed location, that People in downtown area, children, people getting ice cream, walking around, will be able to come and, and understand the significance of him and understand his story. And I think the way to do that would be to, to talk about each, each segments of his service. 
granite boulders, um, what I'm envisioning and what we've discussed, what my team has discussed, is possibly granite boulders with the plaques mounted on the boulder. Um, and I got that information from um, also from our um, from the granite company and also from Susan. And uh, two benches set in concrete. They're kind of set up on my site plan there. Um, the quote came in about four thousand dollars for a total of eight thousand dollars. So that is my proposal, and I'm happy to field any questions. CPC is specifically never allowed to buy plaques or signs or anything. Understood. Of that nature. Okay. That's um, okay. I don't mean to. Anybody else want to jump in before it gets started? Plaques or signs, or oh, oh, remember oh. we've come across that so many times. Um, but the, the main proposal is consistent with those those elements we couldn't do. Yeah. But the statue on the site we could do. We can't fund statues, obviously, because they're not historically. I mean, we can repair statues, but we can't fund new ones. But you knew that you didn't put that in here. I took that. That's why it's seventy thousand dollars less. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am quite curious about how you already have an artist lined up. Uh, did you do an RFP on that? Did you look around for artists and consider? Well, the, the, you mean the sculptress? Yes. Um, just spoke with her on the phone. We found her online. Um, it just room kind of uh, initial information, background information on what the statue would be and things like that. But usually, with town funding, you usually need. But she would be she would be focused on the statue. And I don't think you're going you're to fund the statute. So. Okay, that'll be that was part of it. Will come out of donations from individuals or something. Yeah. So um, we we were fortunate to receive uh, twenty five twenty five thousand dollars already from the Greenwich Mitigation Fund. I'm going to go back to them in the spring, and then uh, I am also I'm planning to privately raise um, a significant amount. Um, it's going to have to be about a hundred thousand dollars. I the think statute. for a good cause, you, that should not be a problem in this town. Well. That's great to know. Um, ownership of the land. So uh, the people building on Settles West don't actually own that yet. They don't have permission to build on it. So, But assuming that goes well, I think yep. you've gotten some initial good reviews. Um, what would be their arrangement with this chunk of land and you all? So um, initially I, I approached the, the applicant about an easement, um, which he was uh, – committed to doing, certainly in concept. And then I learned that CPC funds cannot go toward construction on an easement. So I just recently spoke to him about, would you be interested in, you know, selling this parcel to the town? Which he obviously said he was committed to doing and happy about, but obviously he would have to own it first. So uh, definitely committed to the project itself, definitely wants to see this happen, but it would obviously be after the permitting process. He, he would turn it over to the town. He would literally... Yeah. Yeah give it to you or sell it to you. You have to sell it. One other funny question, the sketch that Sevy did of the buildings, I know he's designing that building, so he knows what it's going to look like. Yeah, he does. It has a statue next to it, which, if it's in scale, looks like it'd be peeking in the second story window. <laughs> did you take a look? I don't know if that was the scale or not. <laughs> I just looked at it. I don't know where I put it. Here it is. So, if right. that's the little statue right there, he's literally, his head is looking, in, it's not that big. So, uh, Benjamin Lincoln, I think it was about five foot Nine. Yeah, he was short. He was short. Five foot eight, five foot nine. Um, a statue would probably be about six feet, you know, on the base. So the yeah. base, he'd be about six feet up to give him more prominence, is what our sculptors told us. Um, so although he wasn't tall, he was obviously wide. I think his waist was about forty six inches. So <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the money for the statue is going to go to the creation of his waistline. Which way is he going to be looking? Down the street? Um, it would be probably. Straight ahead, probably out, and then the park would go around him in terms of, if we know, his service. service so who's the leader of the schism that led to New North? Maybe she was looking towards New North. Well, we could, we could look at that. Yeah, you're right. That's right. We actually looked at Fountain Square as a possibility, and we, we discussed it with our, our committee during our site walk, and we were nervous about the prominence of this statue taken away from the prominence of Abraham Lincoln. We also looked at um, the tunnel cap as a possible site. Uh, which I liked, but the, the issue is that that's kind of owned, operated by the MBTA. It's a difficult process to go tunnel cap. We have um, there's also utility lines under there that we're nervous. Of. We also have two other sites proposed. Um, we also looked at the town common as a site, as the hanging militia trained up there. And I talked to um, 
Alan Peral about the possibility of the bathing beach as a possible site too. So I would submit to the committee that the location is not going to be the problem. All three of those locations, I think, can work. Um, the issue is going to be my ability to raise a, quite a bit of uh, private funds. My only thought on that is that you started out by saying he's the most prominent person associated with Hingham, Massachusetts. Who actually lived here, actually worked here. His house is right next to Fountain Park. Yep. The church he built, Old North, is right across from it. Yeah, so we, the committee that we looked at was pretty unanimous that people didn't want it to go on the phone park. So um, that's why we're there. Next to a condo and stores. Uh, we, I think it's important to have them in the downtown area um, because, you know, although like the, we looked at the Bathing Beach and we looked at the town common, I think, you know, in the downtown areas, we're going to have more, most prominence. Um It'll be most appreciated in the downtown area, and it can mean walking distance of, you know, uh, the ice cream store, shops, you know, I think with this development on Southern Glass, it will kind of um, be a bridge down to the harbor in a lot of ways. I think this will help. Um, so you said this, you think the base will be six feet tall and he's five, eight. So we're looking you know, the total will be about six feet. So him with the base would be six feet. He's about five, eight, five, nine. Oh, so it's just a small base. It's not. Yes, a correct. Base. Oh, okay. Yep. I was thinking danger, but. No, the, to the total height would be about six feet. Okay. So he's not looking at the second floor windows. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that would be awful large. That would be awkward. Yeah. Okay, I'm dominating. Who else wants to ask a question? your point, Bill, in terms of the access to the statue, if it's by the, the site you're proposing, because I've been, for example, with my children, the statue with the turtles and the frogs on it that's on yep, South sure. Street. We've been there a hundred times. I've never actually taken my children over to the Abraham Lincoln statue. Like We've been, we've driven by it thousands of times, but you don't really visit it, you know, whereas if you want it to be an interactive telling a story, you would need to be able to visit it. That's why we put the buckets on the the boulder, the yeah. next step yeah. down. So it, yeah. it would be great to have another step. I'm, I'm just a little getting bad feng shui about our most prominent person just being part of a connecting path. I don't know. His house is right there. His church is right there. Anyway, too much opinion. Just one quick question. Sure. So when might the developer actually acquire the land? It sounds like... Yeah, so when he completes the permitting process, so he's... he's um, uh, I think his next stop is probably the planning board, zoning board. Uh, I think once he get beyond those boards, I think he's basically completed the process. Um, so he's, I would assume probably by the spring, but I'm, I've, I'm not, I'm not recusing myself from the permitting process, so I couldn't tell you exactly the, the dates and times. So you're really going to fall into recreation? Is that like, yeah, I, I put open space, recreation, I think. I think it's checked out both. Historic preservation, and it's not housing, and it's not open space. So. Correct. Okay. Well, is there sure. a dimensions to the park? Um, just, just the 500 square feet uh, brick was, area. Um, maybe possibly six foot of concrete off of the, the um, off of the sidewalk, but the park itself is going to be the 500 square feet okay. of the brick with the concrete okay. and, base. And so brick, so we're not talking about uh, necessity for DPW to do a lot of... Yeah, um, I don't, I you know, that, that, that came up. I don't, I, don't, I don't see that as being a real right, big issue because it's going to be going to be all brick. Great. Yeah. Good yeah. to know. I mean, there'd probably be a... Um, uh, probably a trash receptacle there, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be heavy left for that for me. Great. Thank you. Anyone? Great chatty group tonight. Thank you. Thank Great. Thank you. And, uh, Larry, thank you for this information. I'm right with Send our regards to Alex. Yeah, thank you. Then we're back to only 10 minutes off. Now we're going to look at the Bennett property at 0 Charles Street. Lonnie, who's going to present it? Good. And Charlie Berry. We enjoyed getting out to see this property. The site tour was well done. Thank you all for coming to see them. I was, I was impressed with the turnout. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Fournier. I'm the conservation agent um, tonight representing primarily the Conservation Commission. Would you like me to close the door? Dave, you want to grab the door? Thank you. With me um, tonight is a great partner, Charlie Barry. He's the chair of the Open Space Acquisition Committee. Uh, and without him, I don't think this project or the next project would be before you tonight. So a lot of the work has fallen on Charlie's shoulders. Um, so first we're talking about the Bennett property. It's on Charles Street. It's eight acres, predominantly forested. There is um, a narrow section of meadow or maintained lawn area um, that has some beehives in it. And so um, I'll just take you to the next slide so that you can see. So coming off the, the point near Charles Street, you can see a, a cleared strip that's more meadow area. And then the rest is forested and undeveloped for the most part. Um, Charlie is going to speak briefly about the little garage workshop in the bottom corner of the property. Uh, you notice the, <clears throat> the building to the right of the yellow line here at the bottom is a shop. And though it's part of this parcel, it would most likely be carved out because Dave Bennett, whose house is right on Charles Street, right where it says Charles, um, that's the shop and office that he uses for his um, electrician business. So that would likely be carved out, but it is uh, would have a slight effect on the overall price. Correct. And another important characteristic about the property is that it's currently enrolled in the 61A tax program by the state. And for our conversation, the most important piece of that means that the property is currently taxed at a lower rate than it would be if it was a residential use. Um, the state is in charge of evaluating and accepting properties as part of the 61A program. And so at any point in time, uh, for whatever reason, whether the qualifications change um, or anything that might be associated with the state's portion of the program, this property could be removed from that, at which point it would be taxed at a traditional Hingham residential rate. And the property owners have told us at that point they would no longer be able to afford the property and would immediately try to sell it. So while there are some unknowns related to its stability within the 61A program, it's very certain at this point that if for whatever reason it fell out of that program, it would be sold very quickly. And we don't think that would be a problem for them. They've mentioned that several developers have, you know, reached out to them over the years and are interested in the future of the property and an opportunity to develop it. So whether it's the town or whether it's a de developer, there is interest in the property. So the, another important characteristic and something that's really unique and is opportunistic for us is that it's located in an area of large forest blocks. So this map depicts the Bennett property in red, and then to the east we have Wampatuck State Park, and then to the west Jacobs Meadow and the newly acquired Laner Conservation Area, and then further to the south we have George Washington Forest as well as some Aquarian water supply lands. Acquiring large forest blocks is very difficult uh, in today's day. Uh, the, the undeveloped parcels are few and far between. Those that are large enough to support you know, small critters and larger sort of migratory animals are very special. And certainly this piece, this property fits into the large forest block component of this portion of town. Um, so it is, it's pretty unique in where it's situated and it would absolutely support these surrounding lands. When, just before we leave that one, Lonnie, I'd just like to add that uh, what's important, one thing that's important to wildlife uh, is the ability to get from one large piece of open space to another. And this, as you can see, would provide an important corridor from the laner and other conservation land um, to the east of LaZelle Street over into Wampatuck to the, to the west. Private land, an obstacle to crossing over to Wampatuck, or is that manageable? That little piece at the far right tip, tip to the east yeah. of it, yeah. that is a uh, 
part of a parcel of open land that includes that little tail up top and then widens out down to South Pleasant Street. That's 17 plus acres. So walking across it wouldn't be a problem. No, no, no. It's uh, it's uh, undeveloped. It's undeveloped and undevelopable. No one's watching. Okay. No. no. Thanks. Okay. One of the uh, important aspects of a piece of property like this, if you can show the next slide on, mm -hmm. is that it uh, protects the town's water supply. This is similar to the Laner property, if you recall, when we talked about that at town meeting, um, there is a large basin of granite that is formed by Lazelle Street to the east and Main Street to the west. And it's essentially like a big tub full of very sandy, gravelly soils. And the importance of that is that at the top of this slide, you see four drops with the little white rings around them. Those are the town wells at Free Street, which supply about 80% of our drinking water. And all of this water flows through, slowly through the soil in a northerly direction. It also flows uh, in the rivers you can see on there. There's Fulling Mill Brook, which runs right along the, by the dotted line. And you notice right up below where it says Free Street, it joins uh, Crooked Mill Brook and they form collectively the Ware River along with Tower Brook Road, so, uh, Tower Brook, Brook rather. So um, it's all, this is where our water comes from, so everything that drains in there is important. The uh, other important aspect of the Bennett property is it is part of what's called Zone 2 Wellhead Protection Area. Uh, it's a very nitrogen sensitive area. Nitrogen is a serious pollutant in, in water and can't be removed by the filtration systems that we have. So um, whenever a piece of property is developed in an area like this, it goes through a pretty stringent process of nitrogen load analysis uh, and uh, perk tests and other uh, soil analysis tests to make sure that the nitrogen load is uh, is not going to adversely affect the water. And so, just for clarification or clarity, this portion of town, it would be septic systems on this lot if it was developed. Um, it's not connected to town sewer. There is actually um, just on the southern end of Charles Street, so right up to about the V where it connects with Lazelle, there is town or public water. <laughs> it's a habit of mine, I call it town water. Um, there's public water on the south side of Charles Street, and then possibly on the far northern end as well. That I'm not 100% not sure of, but certainly in this immediate area of Charles and the Bennett property, um, there is public water. I think that all of the property to the north of this along both sides of LaZelle Street is served by wells, yep. private wells. So it's, it's not, not just the town's public water supply, but also the private wells that uh, need protection. Mm -hmm. I think the last piece that you probably recognize when you were out there visiting the site is that its its current undeveloped nature contributes to the scenic and bucolic character of Charles and Lazelle Streets. Um, when Charlie and I talk about this property, he often refers to Lazelle Street as the roller coaster road. And so um, it's familiar to many people who have lived in Hingham for a long time. It's very scenic. You have larger lots with stone walls, um, forested areas. The houses are set back. It's just very scenic. LaZelle Street itself is a scenic road, designated scenic road in town. Um, Charles is not, but certainly this property is close to the scenic and, you know, inherits some of that scenic character from LaZelle Street. So this is standing on Charles looking north towards Lazelle with the open meadow area on the right hand side and the next photo is standing at the intersection of Lazelle and Charles looking south on Charles Street um, again some stonewall components forested land open meadows it all is it all fits really well with the character of those two streets the strategic purpose of our bringing this forward is that 
if we were to uh, would acquire this land and take it off the market, it would not only limit development on this parcel, but if you recall a couple of um, slides back, there are adjacent parcels that are also undeveloped land. And um, by taking this parcel out, it would lessen significantly lessen the ability for those adjacent parcels to be developed as well. Together, if, the, if, if the, all the parcels there were acquired by a developer, there could be some pretty significant development seen there. There's the potential for flexible residential development with increased density, um, common open space, clustered housing, uh, it would uh, drastically change the, the look of, of the whole area. Has anyone estimated the number of plots that could be in there? Number of? Houses? Development? Um, like at Laner, you had some people who had actually bid on it and knew, you knew what could go in there. Any sense um, of what could go in here? No. I think that the I think the planning, planning department may have an idea, but I, I don't know to what extent because you know no perk tests yeah. none of that stuff has been done the the only thing that's been done in appraising this property is to rely on data that's available from maps mm -hmm. and looking at the town's bylaws etc but uh, none of this uh, none of this or the adjacent properties have been uh, been tested uh, in terms of the soils mm -hmm. We do have some information about soils from adjacent properties that are built upon and that do have septic systems. And uh, they uh, they have indicated that um, septic systems here are, are problematic uh, due to high groundwater, uh, which is so something I'll mention in a second. Oh, I guess I'm going to do that now. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the appraisal report um, astonished me, frankly. And um, then they looked at it more closely, and I saw that there is one very extraordinary assumption made, which is it's, it appropriate for an appraiser to make, but it assumes that this is the price that a developer would be willing to pay having received approval for a six-lot subdivision. And there are several things that um, can complicate this. One is timing. Um, the street was just paved this year, so it can't be reopened for five, until spring of 2024. Mm -hmm. um, that was not factored into the appraisal. Um, the street also has a new street. Uh, if a new street was put in to serve um, the development, there's a sight line problem. As you notice, the hill, uh, well, the, the property is low relative to the road, and then there's a hill. So how to deal with that sight line problem is something that comes under the selectmen. Whether the selectmen would allow uh, the street to be lowered uh, is an open question. Uh, how much fill can be put in to raise the level of the soil adjacent to the road is another question regulated by a planning board, and they have pretty specific regulations about that. So. Uh, this wasn't addressed, and nor would the nor have, as I mentioned, any uh, soil test been, been done, and the, so the wellhead two protections have not been addressed as yet. So um, I would say that the appraisal is still a bit of a work in progress. Uh, we didn't receive it until uh, this weekend, so we've had little time. It's three weeks late. We had little time to uh, look at these issues, but we we are addressing them with the appraiser. I I have I can tell you that the the appraisal uh, 
although it astonished us, um, didn't surprise the owners because it's not out of line uh, with numbers that they've heard from developers. Developers um, tend to talk that way pretty optimistically about what they what they think they can put in, um, but the our job here is to try and come up with what we think is really a reasonable price that the town should be expected to pay if the property is removed from development. And so we have some more work to do um, to see what that number might be. We know, of course, that the existing <laughs> price price is a definite budget buster. Um, um, I think, so we're still very much in the first two bullet points of the next steps, um, having recently accepted the, re the appraisal report, actively working with the appraiser on that, um, just having some initial conversations with the Bennett family this morning, I believe. Um, we're still very much in the upper portion of this list. Um, if we were to arrive at a number that we think would be palatable to both CPC and the town and the Bennett family, then we would move forward with the other due diligence items, um, work to acquire the property, and then as with all CPC acquisitions, we would follow up with a conservation restriction that's required. So that's the, the long term of it, but we are still very much focused on the first two items uh, this time. So hopefully we'll have much more information for you at the next round of meetings. Right now, that's that's all, that's what we know and what we could forecast moving forward. And you all hear what we said earlier that our next round is January, January. 2nd, 3rd. So mm -hmm. by then, it has to be a firm amount we can't hold on. Yep. Um, when we met with them, clearly the Bennetts would prefer it to be kept natural. It's mm -hmm. been in the family, and mm -hmm. they love it. And um, But at some point, they can't pass up cash. If Absolutely. It's, yeah. And that's really the, the most challenging piece of this is um, they spoke a lot to us about uh, wanting to uphold their their family's vision for the property and to see it undeveloped and protected. Um, but there's also a, a pocket of money there that might be appealing for whatever reason. Um, so that's nothing that we can decide. It's something that they have to decide themselves. So. It's one of the nice things that 61A has done is allow families to hold on to land yeah. that they mother, might otherwise be able to uh, afford to hold on to. But uh, it is subject to annual review and uh, uh, changing regulations as to um, what, what qualifies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At our site tour, the one thing that struck me right up front was the drop in that land right off of the street. Mm -hmm. So as you say, they'd have to have some kind of approval to either bring in an awful lot of fill or build a bridge or something. It looks like a sunken soccer field. And right. then the rest of the land up behind it. But it's beautiful, beautiful property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And as you know, from looking at our numbers, we'd have to, you know, we'd have to borrow to help you out. So um, with those arguments in hand, and yet it is feeding into the town well. So that's the biggest plus, I guess. Yeah, well, it's one of these things, when, when the time comes, we have to look at them and um, find the resources wherever we can. Um, then there is this world to look at. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll keep working on it. <laughs> You're not in the green bush zone, unfortunately. You can't go down there. But any questions on this particular property? I just have one question. So... Let, let's say the town decides it can't even afford to go after the land and the family puts it up for sale and developers, I guess, either go, it, it, there's a bid or one developer comes forward and they offer X amount compared to the Y price and the family says, yes, that's good. But just like when you buy a private house, you, you know, you have it inspected. Do they do their thing of seeing how the land perks and would the road be allowed to be leveled a little bit? And so, in other words, is it possible that the actual value would be could turn out to be greatly different from the appraisal based on what was found out in the developer's due diligence process? Yes, mm -hmm. typically a developer um, 
signs a purchase and sale agreement with, with the landowner and puts up a minimal amount of money, and usually the developer is responsible for all of the costs of getting the subdivision approved. And uh, there are assumptions in an appraisal about what those costs might be to get a subdivision approved. And the assumptions, you know, are, are based upon um, the information that the appraiser has available, which in this case uh, is pretty much maps, um, because they said no soil testing or anything has been done. So um, a developer would typically say, you know, if I, if I get a three lot subdivision approved, it's one price, four lots, five lots, mm -hmm. six lots. And then at the end of that time, um, the, the property actually changes hands, there's a closing, and the developer takes over. Okay, thanks. Unless there's any questions, we've got to move on. We're yeah. falling further and further behind. We've all night. Um, luckily, it's the same people. Uh, Studley property. This one's a little easier. <laughs> Sudley property is uh, ten and a half acres of forested land. It's a beautiful spot at the end of Levitt Street, um, running to the northeast, and um, it's tucked up in there uh, by the uh, trustees' reservations land and Wampatuck. Uh, it has. Uh, wetlands on it, and all of the adjacent parcels also contain wetlands. There are, there are a dozen private wells within 1,500, 2,000 feet of, of this area, and um, it's currently assessed at $126,000. James Hill Lane is a town accepted roadway. It can be developed if somebody wants to spend the money. And our, per our reason for purchasing it would be to take this piece out of the mix um, to lessen the possibility that somebody could aggregate several parcels there and, and create a viable development. This piece is um, the largest piece along James Hill Lane. Down right next to Levitt Street is another large piece. There are three other parcels right along the road, um, and they all have different owners. Uh, I'd want to point out that if James Hill Lane is to be developed, it would have to be meet the subdivision standards, town road standards, and that would include a cul-de-sac, and the only place on James Hill Lane that is big enough to put a cul-de-sac is up on the Studley property. So if we were to acquire this property, it essentially eliminates the possibility of the rest of the uh, properties being developed. I think the only piece that I'd like to add here is for visually I've always imagined these parcels, it's all the privately owned parcels are on the southern end of southern side of James Hill Lane only the northern side is protected by the trustees but they all line up like dominoes in my mind and so all it will take is either a collaboration amongst property owners or a potential developer or one very ambitious person to bring the utilities and the services and the standards to this area before one by one they all go. So while it is pretty expensive to bring them bring this area up to development standards, um, it just takes one and then they're all right for the picking. Um, I'd like to add one little thought of my own. Mm -hmm. You keep calling it a lane and a town-owned mm -hmm. road. I think the term road is kind of loosely used in there. It well, was it's, yeah. it's a dirt full road. of stones and oh, sure. I mean, trees sitting over it. It, it. it is approved as a road. Yeah. Mean, it's, it it's has accepted. the same status in many respects as Central Street. It's a public way. You can walk on it. and it. it uh, but it could be if somebody wanted to spend the money, they could they make could it a real road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how far did we walk? It felt like 20 miles to me. <laughs> <laughs> All the way. We walked up to the gate. Yeah. 
all the way up to the gate. So all the way up to the town line. What, what is that distance? It's that tells us. Line. What is that? Uh, that I think it's miles. Is it the that's trustee? the trustee's yeah. property. Um, I think it's a little over two thousand feet. A little over two thousand feet. I think half mile. <laughs> but it was so beautiful, wasn't it? <laughs> Yep. So, like Bennett, Studley is also nestled very nicely within other protected open spaces. Um, this is a map of the area. So, to answer the questions, right on the other side of the Cohasset or the Hingham Line in Cohasset, that's Whitney and Thayer Woods, trustees. North side of James Hill Lane is also trustees. Um, all leading all the way up to 3A with Weir River Farm and Turkey Hill. And then to the south, we have Wampatuck State Far Park and Trapeira Pond. This is a puzzle piece. It's It fits so nicely into the area and amongst all the other protected lands. That, that picture shows your domino effect, how yeah. easy it would be. <laughs> yeah, right. they're, well, yeah, they're all lined up one by one on the southern side. There, there are actually, I think, seven parcels of land that could be aggregated. I think the next one shows that. Oops, sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. Point. <laughs> We're still pointing. <laughs> What's the status of the triangle right next to it? The what? The white triangle just to the. the that's open. That's one of the parcels that I mentioned. See that triangle? Then it narrows right out at James Hill Lane where yeah. it says. Then there, the land to this. South of that is also vacant land. Mm -hmm. So those parcels and one or two of the parcels on the other side of Levitt Street down to further south could be aggregated. And the limiting factors on developing this land is the availability of Tom Warner, which you have to have a hydrant within 800 feet. But it could be brought up Levitt Street if there was enough economic potential in the land that the, that the person had. Um, so that's that could happen. Um, so that might be worth future attention. Pardon me? That might be worth future attention, that, that undeveloped parcel. Mm -hmm. It's owned by someone. Yeah. yeah. So I said it might oh, be worth future attention. Oh, yeah. After, after Possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get this one off the table. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> future, after, after this is finished. Okay. Um, Do you mind if I? I'm going to jump to the next one because okay. the appraise, the appraisal for this one actually came in um, thirty thousand less than the town's assessed value. It came in at ninety-five thousand, and um, Mr. Sudley is agreeable to selling it for that price and. Uh, I'd like to point out that, as well, he's in the process of giving the town three other parcels of land that are all unbuildable. But, um, and it is not, that gift is not contingent on this, but um, he's uh, <laughs> been paying taxes on 126 and willing to settle for 95. I mean, I think it's a, a reasonable deal nice all around. And to protect this property and the rest of those adjacent properties, make that all green uh, would be great. The this is the picture you recall. That's that's pretty much what it looks like all the way up to the gate. It's just a, a beautiful walk, nicely forested woods. Are there any questions? Oh my goodness! What do you go Pardon me? Would he go lower? <laughs> um, I try. Um, he thinks that it's a reasonable price. He's been paying taxes on it since, I think, 1998, and um, he is throwing in some other pieces, and it's kind of, kind of hard to argue with him. He's never tried to sell it, though. Mike's never put it on the market, or... No. No, he has been approached, mm -hmm. but he uh, he's always wanted to. Yeah, keep it all together. Keep it this way. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Nice job. Next on our list is Affordable Housing Trust. I do believe we have Tim White and Britton DeBose are here.
All right. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Britton DeVose, and this is Tim White, the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust. And um, I presented to you last year. We're back. Um, this year, we're requesting uh, $350,000, which is a decrease from what we requested last year. We made a little bit of progress, and that's what you're holding in your hands is a photo of um, what we used some of the money that we received from CPC last year for, which is a house um, you may, may or may not recognize. It's on the corner of Cushing and Derby Street, um, a house that we're hoping to even make into a bigger opportunity beside that one house. So um, before I get into those details or share those details, um, we are requesting $350,000 this year, really an opportunity funding. We want to continue to make the progress that we've made in this uh, town in affordable housing. Um, we've met the requirements, so to speak, um, but we as a trust feel like it's our mission to continue to make progress, and we know that we have to make progress. Um, there are new standards to be um, met you know, as time goes on. So we don't want to lose the ground that we have made. Um, we also look at our financials and um, use that to calculate how much we're asking for this year. 70% of our current and also incoming funding has already been allocated. Um, that leaves us with around $250,000 um, left after we take care of a number of um, issues that you've seen in the accounting and the, the second round application, uh, which I'm happy to answer any questions about. But $250,000, as we know, does not go a long way in Hingham, um, and hence why our trust exists and why we're here now. Um, I think I'd really turn it to Tim and see if you have anything to add there. Otherwise, we're you know happy to answer any questions as well as go through any of the questions related to the accounting and what we have in play already. I'm curious. I'm sorry. How yeah. much did we give you last year? Um, it was around, there was, there was a swapping of money, but it was around $400,000, which is an increase then from what we've received in the past. Um, but... And we're very appreciative of that. 464500 yeah. and then we are returning 158927 that was previously dedicated to the selections process. So, so are you returning money? Yes. What? It hasn't gone back yet, I don't believe. No. no. What's up? So what we turned money from the affordable... Right. No, it was it was it was monies that were dedicated to the selectman's parcel. Okay. That we had received pr previously from you, because we um, the town wanted us to look at the potential of having an assisted living facility there. Yeah, and, and it, it kind of didn't. It, it, right. it, it didn't fly at that time. We haven't given up on it yet, just so you know that. But it didn't fly at that time, so it made sense to return the funds because it wasn't they weren't going to be used for, as they were requested. So we're clawing back how much is it? One hundred and fifty eight thousand nine twenty seven. So you just net it out and that'll tell you really what the, yeah. the amount is. But but Carol, you're right, it was funding last year, it just hasn't gone back yet. So, so we just we need to account for it to say where our balances are. Had you had it more than we two did. years when it was a pre yes yes yeah. mm -hmm. okay. yes. Okay. That was as of I think the August okay. budget that we looked at. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, our treasurer wasn't at our September meeting. Mm -hmm. We're October. We're October, right? But as of August, it hadn't gone back. We don't like hearing money coming back from you people. That's so, we. No. <laughs> we want to be <laughs> Except that you were very generous with us yeah. last year, so it kind of balanced out in a nice way. Right. Can I right. ask two math questions? Mm -hmm. um, the, the 250 that you say is left after mm -hmm. everything is, has been spent that's committed, yeah. does that include the 10% of CPC that um, you are required to get in 2019 or... Yeah. Not no, that. That does okay. not. And then your 350 ask, mm -hmm. do you mean that on top of the 10% that you're required to get or included? Yeah. Include, include, included. Inclusive of that. Okay. Right. Thanks. Um, and the other thing I'll um, put out there is that um, we do have a property on Whiting Street that we're in a partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Um, with and to, to develop two units there, and um, they were going to request $100,000 in support of 
building those two units and we've decided that we would take on that request for them so yeah. the 350 is inclusive of the 100 that habitat for humanity yeah. okay. so it didn't right. go away it just got calculated they, differently right. yeah. Yeah. so if i'm looking at this right yeah. the 167 720 that you would get this year automatically as your 10 percent plus the 180 158 927 you're clawing back to us that's 326 to begin with and you're only asking 350. The 167 that okay that were and then the 158. Yes. Well, I got to the 70 percent by assuming that the 150 158 was going back to you already. So then the right right. But that'll go so, into housing. I mean, it'll hold. We hold it. Right. In a separate account. Right. So then right. Um, so then the 167 that we're expected to get 10% is um, and then so we're basically asking two or 200 or 180 whatever the math is there 350 minus 167 that's what we're asking but for in Carol, addition to the 167 yeah. what Carol is saying I yeah. think yeah. another way to look at this mm -hmm. is so there's the 167 there's the 158 you're giving back mm -hmm. right right yeah that's you're already 325 so you're you're asking for 25 over that right okay you're asked just got yes. a lot more attractive yes yeah, yeah. I like that yeah. way of looking you sure you don't want to change that no you're absolutely right no, you're exactly you're exactly right <laughs> Just because we're talking about, though, I think it's 116, not 160. Oh, 116. Mm -hmm. Not uh, 167. No, oh, no, you're right. 116. Okay, so but I'm still. off a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank but, you. Yes. But still. Yes. Da, da, da. Yes. It makes up for it. That. It yes. makes you all look really good now. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything happening now? Sure. Uh, Whiting Street has gone through, the, got the uh, approval from DHCD on the lip. The local initiative petition to proceed with the permitting process here with the town and so that's where it is now it's going it's, it's the, the permitting process is just getting just getting underway so and that's with two units so the proposal is to two two units one of the one on Whiting street one halfway down the road approximately yes well yeah on the same lot. Yeah, yeah yeah where yeah. is it and if you came up cushing would you go like if you if you came up cushing would you go left or right Toward Linden Ponds. Towards Linden Ponds. Okay. Beyond, it's it's right before Derby Brook, right right near the golf course. Okay. Yeah. So the old house, you can find the lot for the second house. Yes. Yeah. The lot originally had two lot, two houses on it, so yeah. we're hopeful that it's going to be a yeah. it looks like a with three successful months. endeavor. Yeah. Oh, this one, this photo, where is this? Is on Cushing? Is it? That's a ninety nine Cushing. What is this used? Do people live here now? So we just purchased it this summer. Um, funds from you. If with funds from CPC. Yeah, I like, I like the sign. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And um, we are now exploring um, if we're able to develop the back part of the lot. There's what a half an acre behind that. Yeah. It actually stretches back significantly. Um, it's more than a half acre. More than a half acre. Yeah. But it's a very, it's a very narrow lot. Um, so it's kind of, we've, we've sent it out for an engineering review, which came back very recently, that indicates that you certainly could attempt to do that, but it would have to be through a 40B, is the most likely procedure. So we're, we're investigating now a friendly 40B, working with the town planner and town engineer. So, so our idea is we've got the lot, we've got the house, we'd hopefully build another house on it, and then we would sell both of those houses to affordable mortgage applicants and um, essentially get two units for the town with the funding that we received from CBC. Was 40B just for side yards? Is it just because of side yards? It's no, more the side. There's, there's, there's a, there'd be a number of, of uh, waivers we'd require. Uh -huh. yeah. but, uh, but the access, even the driveway getting in is probably going to... Yeah. But, but it's all, it all can make sense with the way you're going to lay it out. We think we can make it make yeah. sense, yes. Mm -hmm. we're, we're relying on the professionals at this stage. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You're doing great work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your support. As I said before, you're looking better all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I guess I'm just looking. Is that you have any addition to this or in place of it? Well, that's another option. Okay. It's, it's like trying, trying to do something. Well, I'll trust you to look at the best possibility. Now we've got 
update of the 2007 Master Plan for Hingham Harbor. Presenting is Bill Reardon from the Harbor Development Committee. Where did he go? Bill just... <laughs> Are you from the committee? Would you... Oh, okay. Any comments about anything? Adcom, any thoughts? Well, speaking of the harbor, it's sad that the gazebo proposal has been withdrawn. Yeah, who's Bill Rude? Thank you, Bill. It's always amazing how many good ideas there are. Yeah. Sorry about the timing mess up. You're on. Yeah. <laughs> we got a minute that quickly. I'm hoping I might get a tech assist to get something on my computer up on that screen. Where's Carol now that we need her? Where is she? Do you need help with that, Bill? I need help with the connection, yes. I'm not... Uh, Dave to the rescue. A whole room full of teams and we can't get the computer. Carol, Bill's going to try to hook up to our system. There we go. Good evening, everybody. Is everybody You're here? literally on. <laughs> Jim Wilson is not, uh, uh, Jim Watson is not back. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> happy to be here and uh, take this opportunity to describe the application of the Harbor Development Committee for a um, grant that would redo the 2007 master plan. I'm assuming you've all had a chance to read the proposal and particularly to focus on this graph. I don't know whether I can, David, maybe you can see if you can expand that so that it takes the full screen. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm Bill Reardon, Chairman of the Harbor Development Committee, and the Development Committee is before you requesting this uh, for the first time in 11 years to revisit what was called the, the master plan from Hingham Harbor. Uh, as I said, last done in 2007. Um, it's not the only master plan that the town has ever had, I discovered. <clears throat> there were at least two others, although this one was the most recent, and it happened at a very opportune time because a task force had been uh, prepared by the selectmen and they had done an exhaustive search of the legalities of properties along the harbor. So it, it was a very opportune time to, you know, revisit what was going on at the harbor and what could go on. But it was 11 years ago. I'll remind you, as the front of my application did, very first page of the written material, I don't have any other PowerPoint than this. We'll just focus on this and I'll, and I'll walk us through. The objectives of the plan in 2007 were, the biggest one, a pedestrian walkway, akin to the Boston Harbor Walkway, which has had been evolving over uh, the last several years prior to 2007. So that, that was a vision. How can we pull all these different parcels controlled by different entities together and increase the the recreational use and particularly just just the ability for people to get down on the on the harbor um, they wanted to focus on a lot of other uses that hadn't yet happened at the harbor so they they raised a number of um, uh, subjects that that might be considered 
some of which have happened, some of which may or may never happen. It was a planning vision. Uh, and the target, again, was the next five to 15 years. We're now in year 11. By the time we got here, we'd be in year 12. So we're at the outside of the, of the planning time frame. Now what I want to do is just sort of tick off for you the things that have happened since that have caused the original plan. This is not the original plan. This is a rendering that uh, Presley and Associates did for me to update you and, and others in town about <clears throat> what's been happening because there's, there's an enormous amount that's been happening kind of across the whole front of the harbor. The prior plan was before the mobile state mobile station purchase. It, the, uh, their planning document still shows the mobile station on, on the chart. <clears throat> there were changes in ownership in two of the uh, marinas in town. <clears throat> John Kenny uh, purchased from Tom Hastings <clears throat> and Dana Baxter. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, I'm losing the name of the individual <clears throat> behind the uh, red, uh, the uh, Bond. Nick Bond. Right. So that changed both in terms of their attitudes toward the harbor and the way that they were going to run their businesses. Um, the Lincoln Sailing Club existed in 2007. You'll know it's now the Hingham Maritime Center. <clears throat> With huge changes, rowing has just become an enormous thing, and there's probably more rowing activity going on out of that. Uh, that's off Barnes Wharf, which is just, oh, we do have a point here. I think. Is this working, Carol? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, no, this, no, no, I just want to, I just want to point you this. Okay. There we go. So, Hingham Maritime is, is in this space right here. And as I mentioned, whereas um, in 2007, they were principally a sailing club, just kind of beginning to get into rowing now with the Hingham High Rowing Team, with their own rowing uh, programs, it's a huge, huge difference. Um, also, big difference, <clears throat> that wharf, which at the time was on a very short-term basis, we now have a 30-year lease with Hingham Maritime, subject to some constraints. So that's changed the sort of whole attitude toward that, that parcel. Uh, the Whitney Wharf Bridge right here, you'll remember, was completed in 2016, and the ramp leading up to it, much of it with CPC funds for which Harbor Development is most appreciative. <clears throat> and most recently, we just finished the landscaping. There's a small uh, area right behind Red Eye Roasters that's been uh, <clears throat> with some, some help from my spouse. <laughs> we've, we've finished off. The Kleinfelder study was, issued, was completed in 2015. This is the one that dealt with sea level rise across the whole harbor front, pointing out the areas that were weak and, and uh, were um, capable of being breached, and we saw them breached in March of last year, 2018. You remember the pictures in the, in the Hingham Journal. Um, that has led to the process that Harbor Development has been proceeding in town meeting over the last three years to deal with um, the, the condition of Town Pier and Whitney Wharf and Barnes Wharf and what we refer to as the mobile station property here and the Veterans um, Memorial parcel here, that, that wall as well. Uh, we've been proceeding down that path. We're to the point where we've decided what we want to do uh, and, and what materials we want to use. We've run that by all the way through the selectmen, and right now we're in the process of permitting for that. An important part of that is that the walls for Town Pier and for um, Barnes Wharf will be raised about three and a half feet. Uh, and then, on top of that, we want to continue to have our harbor walk. So, obviously, it needs to, needs to uh, tie into that. Um, the harbor walk activity, let's see, I'm sorry, back up. Um, bathing Beach, big change since 2007. I'm, I'm, I have to say, Bathing Beach was kind of, the trustees were kind of a group unto themselves. Over 
the last five, six years as Alan Peralt went on to the Bathing Beach Trustees, he had been chair of the Harbor Development. So Harbor Development and Bathing Beach Trustees have been working very much together. It's led to a period of you know dramatic activism there. Whoops, oh dear, what did I do? And I think I hit the wrong. It's, it, I hit HDMI. Here we go. I gotta just be really careful with that. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, first they did the armor stone here, then they did the front of the bathing beach, the parking lot, all of that. Um, then they. Uh, have been, as you well know, and you're going to hear tomorrow evening about uh, further activity. But we're we've signed a contract. We have we will proceed this fall with the ba with the stack shack and bathhouse. Courtesy of your good efforts, this part this portion was done, and of and this portion was extended last spring. And this winter, we will do this portion of the brick harbor walk, eight feet wide. Uh, just the site of baby carriage is coming from Crow Point and coming on here rather than out on uh, Otis Street has been just a, a, a big boom. So a big, a big change there. Um, here is the boat ramp. Uh, Mass DMR and the fisheries people have agreed on a new, um, we need a new ramp. That's their ramp. They own it. Uh, we, we get to use the lot we have to do it in, in conjunction with them. So that activity is going on. Uh, North Street, think about what's happened to downtown since 2007. The whole reconstruction of North Street, the tearing down of the light poles. You may not remember, it was in my time with CPC that we put up money to help get rid of those ugly telephone poles. And we now have a streetscape that gets us to about there, but doesn't get us across the street. So a big part of that, and you're well aware of this, is the whole Route 3A corridor transportation study, <clears throat> where there's now the 3A task force uh, that started with the issues on Summer Street, uh, uh, poor uh, site conditions, bad accidents, all of that. That's been going on with Roger Fernandez and uh, now uh, Gene, uh, sorry, um, uh, Harbor Task Force, uh, Judy Steeth, have been leading that effort. I'm going to do a quick aside. I, I've told you before when I've been before you that as part of the $400,000 that the town was uh, appropriated for that full study was to be included about $40,000 for landscape work. Intended probably to come kind of toward the end as they really began to put the design elements together. Uh, your going to find out that at town meeting there will be a request for additional monies because the road diet exercise this summer was much more expensive uh, for the town than, than uh, had been contemplated. So the $40,000 is not there and, and therefore we need to look to other sources for, for the landscaping assistance. But that project is you know very key and is, and is going on kind of as we speak. So the point is all of this you know, all of those things I've just described impact this entire harborscape, and that's the space that we're asking for this money to, to help, help have a consultant help us to revisit. Um, they had certain ideas and, and, and that, were, that were included, um, and they're all, a, a number of them have taken place. I mean, the, this, a walkway across to, Whit to Whitney Wharf wasn't there. A, s a snack shack wasn't there. Um, they suggested it, but we just haven't done it. So we need to revisit that. We want to, some of you know, we did a full survey of um, 1,300 users of, of the harbor and the, and, and the Route 3A. And a number of people came forward with additional ideas. Some of them will be realized by some of what's been done. Uh, food was a big issue on the harbor. Clean bathrooms, winter bathrooms, not just, uh, you know, if you go into Red Eye Roasters, you have to buy something and, and it's the, there's, there's a weight and they're not keen on it. But as part of the, uh, the bathhouse, there will be 
uh, warm restrooms e- even in the winter. Um, really, could you say that again? There will be warm bathrooms maintained for most of the year uh-huh. in the in the snack shop. Okay. Um, so, the objective of this uh, study would be to create a cohesive, consistent feel for the harbor. One of our challenges has been, as we've worked on individual things along this, how do you make it look and feel the same? If you go around Boston Harbor, uh, and, I, and I happen to do that today, um, the, the the walkways are similar, even the granite posts and the chain, you know, uh, between, between the granite posts, much of the lighting is, is, is similar. Benches a little mixed. We we have seven seven different kinds of benches <laughs> across this this space currently. Um, the the notion would be landscape design di- designer help us think about. We've got some parcels that are not being very actively used. The, the mobile station parcel, which the town purchased in two thousand and eight, I think something like that, is pretty much. As it was, it's been leveled, but we haven't really done anything with it. We are, as part of the redesign of the um, town pier, moving the parking that is currently right here. It's that angled parking. Terrible from a traffic perspective because people have to then turn around, back out, and and they're meeting other cars coming in. We're going to flip that parking down to here thereby opening up this space that will be green space and, and, the, and the walkway that's shown here in red will, will go right around at the water's edge. So all of these things are, are happening. Shade structures, something we don't have anything of now. Think about um, a version of what's on Wollaston Boulevard. You know, there are four or five of those. A lot of people have, have mentioned that. Uh, it's, it's sadness that there's nothing on Whitney Wharf. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful park, but it's hot as hell in the summer. Uh, and and we just we just don't, don't have anything. So that, that kind of thing. Lighting. You know, this is a daytime use right now. There's no reason why over time, particularly as we, with the 3A corridor, one of the real objectives of the 3A corridor work is to create better access across 3A allowing uh, pedestrians to come out from dinner at, uh, you know, the restaurants here or further downtown, cross, walk along the harbor on a, on a uh, summer evening. Imagine if other, we have lights on Whitney Wharf, and that's about it. I mean, there's some big search lights over town pier. There's very little um, here and here. Uh, once again, you know, that, that would just add to the, add to the possibilities. Signage. Uh, we, we got some money from Greenbush Trust last year for the beginning of. Um, did I do it again? <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll just keep going. Dave, if you can revive that, it'd be great. Um, Signage has, has not been anything we've, we've done much with. We got about $6,000, um, not as much as we, we needed. It's enough for five or six signs. Think about s- some of the signage at um, uh, the shipyard. I'm not saying that I'm endorsing that style, but the point is there was some very good historical information. Uh, Andrea Young and I last year for the Land Conservation Trust did a um, – a summary of kind of the history of the harbor and where we're going with the harbor. And Eileen McNamara pulled together some remarkable photos of what's uh, available. So that could be incorporated into signs along the harbor. Presley has helped me understand there's also a difference between interpretive historical signage and just signage saying, where is stuff? If you if you come out of uh, North Street right here and and you you want to go to the bathing beach or to the snack shack, where where is that? Which which end do you go? If you especially if you start downtown and you're new to the town and you just kind of you, you get down to the harbor and there's this this great op- opening up. Yes. Well, this um, the bid for tonight, the sixty thousand yes. would not include 
anything. It's just the planning of where planning. things should go. Right. Not exactly. signs and so good. We can't Absolutely. pay for signs. Um, did you get an RFP out or three bids, or is Presley just automatically divided? Let me give you a sense of that, and, then, and I'll wrap up and open up and further up questions because I know you've been at it a long time. So let me let me just finish up if I could, and then I'll respond to that. Is that all right, Carol? Mm-hmm. Okay. So just uh, I think I've given you a sense of uh, what it is we want. What the products will be is, is first a process because – that's what consultants are good for. The, the Mazzarelli effort in 2007 was that, reaching out to a lot of um, different uh, constituents. It's got to be inclusive. It's got to include all the stakeholders. It's got to include the planning people within the town. That's built into the proposal as, as it's been drafted. Um, you know, we, we need an updated vision for the, for the whole harbor front for all the reasons I've mentioned. Capture the, ele- the elements that we might want to consider quantify them, prioritize them, price them out, and then one of the things that we may well get out of that is the opportunity to seek private funding, which I know you and we are always looking for is sort of pump priming, Um, and a final report with recommendations. That's the objective. Benefits, just a lot more and better use of the harbor. Um, This continuation of, of the Harbor Walk. Ultimately, the objective is, sh- is sort of shown here. The red is what's done. This will be red by uh, by spring, and these other portions uh, are in the are in the works. But obviously, you know, we'll we'll need to do those in conjunction with these other this other work that's going on. So we'll be bringing together all of these progress steps that have uh, that I've described, and I and I hope I haven't o- overdone it. But I just wanted to have a sense. It's just it's just a big moving target, and it's very hard to kind of get down and sort of get you know a single vision. So back to your question, Carol. In pulling this together, um, I Presley had been identified as the consultant working with DCI were the engineers for the 3 a corridor. Right. They had done some initial work, very fairly limited, but they, they knew the space currently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I went to them, reached out to them, and said, look, I'm putting a proposal together. I need to have a sense for what the order of magnitude for what I have in mind, what I've described to you. You know, what would that cost be? And, and, and what would the steps be? And what would the timing be? Many of the questions that your grant application uh, requests. So I, I worked with Presley. Obviously, if, um, if this were granted, we would need to go back, ex- expand perhaps further, give some others an opportunity. I, I will say Presley was very accommodating. This uh, document, they took the original and updated for all of these things that uh, that in your package you'll you'll see the, the the times. Tom Mayo saw this and said, "I've been waiting for this for a year." You know, the, of, of how, how do all the pieces tie together? What do we call these? You know, what what are we doing with with uh, different portions of the of the effort? Kevin, I don't think when we when you and I met, I had this yet. So it's it's been a very very useful well, document. Here. No, well, I did, but I, you know, I, I had to work with them to get it on paper, and they and they did that all gratis. I was I was very appreciative that uh, you know they they put some time in here that uh, was not required. So I'll wrap up with that. My uh, my hope is that uh, CPC will be open to this effort. I know that uh, this committee and the town have been very supportive of matters on the harbor, uh, and and we need to continue to be. This is. It's ongoing, mm-hmm. but um, this would be a big step in terms of looking looking out in the future. So, other questions? Was there any attempt to look at what the other harbors have done, like Marshfield, and therefore put out bids to see what others would would bid on doing this? Um, there are I, people who specialize in just designing for harbors. Yes, and, and Presley is one of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, the If you've been over to uh, East Boston, there's mm-hmm. a, a major park a next park. to the space that um, the Institute for Contemporary Art mm-hmm. uh, just built over there. They, they built a new, um, new museum, and Presley did all of that work and is in the midst of doing the rest it was a two part project so they've got they've got the second what going. makes that so good looking in my eye personally mm-hmm. is that uh, the landscaping the horticultural part of all of that is a wow factor uh, right. and the contract here says there won't be any of that this is just going to be the use of parcels and um, no, transportation I and thought after. that there was some um, discussion and, and certainly in, in my discussion with them 
um, proposed uh, types of plant materials. Uh, but not, that, not put a park here, put a tree there, none of that stuff. Not quite that that detailed, probably no, because you've got you've got to you've got to get into that. Um, and, and they don't include illustrative renderings. I guess that means like one of these guys. Uh, let me see. You're referring the very to last what page of, your, of theirs? Back of your. Uh, it's uh, the last page of there. They, they're saying what's not. Will not include grading, drainage, electrical, lighting, design, environmental, that, that's other details. permitting. Uh, you know, lighting design is, is you, you've got to get an electrical contractor to do that. But included earlier was discussion about lighting. Um, the very back page. Read, 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 read page, read task three. Back page, back of the back thing. Overall project, project, is, I'm sorry. Turn it over. The I don't have thing. it over. Pick up your whole thing and turn it over. Um, I'm, I'm, we're not on the same page, Carol. You're on the same thing we do? It says Presley, that's their contract at the very back, on the back of the last page. Yeah, I've got something called, uh, and it, it concludes overall project assumptions and exclusions. Is that the section you're reading? Yes. Okay, so we're on the same page. But prior to that, on page three, for example, updated final master site design plan, fourth bullet, final report shall all also provide recommended design standards and products for site furnishings, paving materials, site lighting, trees and vegetation, interpretive signage, and other site features. So they're they're making some distinctions in terms of how 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 deep, because this is this is a conceptual plan. It's not, uh, you know, it's not construction drawings. It'll say, we need lighting here. It won't say yes. here's how we're going to do it. Yes, okay. correct. I got you. Other questions, I Vicky. My interest is always recreation, and I know last time you did a survey, um, you know, there's always been a goal for a play area at the at the uh, harbor. So I guess my question, right um, a study such as this, do they take, um, is there some surveying of either townspeople or something to, to, I, to the idea, I mean, certain harbors do have a recreational component. We've talked about it on the, or I've talked about it with Alan. Um, the walkway perhaps has stations. They've talked about it over mm -hmm. the years. So I guess my question is not specifically, but do they come to you with the idea that because of the size or because of the scope of the harbor, it does um, work with a recreational component? You see what I'm saying? I think that goes back, Vicki, to process and, and the notion that just as Mazzarelli uh, interviewed, they, they had a, a number of, of public sessions with various stakeholders in the town, and clearly the recreation department and the, and the town's interest in recreation, you know, feeds, feeds right into that. We did have the specific discussion about the, quote, play area, which you and I and Alan have talked much about, and, and we specifically in, included it, right? It's hard to see, but it's that little blue area right, right there. I said, the, leave, leave that, yeah, because right. we all hope that that's going to happen at some point. Some discussion with them, a little different than your consultant, and says, well, if you want it so close to the water, or should it be, you know, you know, more like over here? Of course, that makes it closer to the Street. road. So, I mean, but that's that's the point. We would we would get into those kinds okay. of conversations. That that's part of the the process. That what a good consultant does is to make sure that all the stakeholders. So we don't get, you know, later in the game. Uh, well, wait a minute. You know, we didn't think about that. And I, and I will say one thing, and, and I, this isn't um, throwing any spears here, but when the 2007 plan was done, because, as I said, at that time, Bailey Beach trustees were a little bit apart. Mm -hmm. They were not very well consulted, right, as it happens. And they never really bought into a fair amount of, of what was suggested. Mm -hmm. And it's only the, the recent generation of Bathing Beach trustees, led by Alan, and, and I know he's in before you tomorrow evening on, on the bathhouse topic. We'll let that go, I think, at this point. Um, that, that we've we've moved ahead, you know, smartly in terms of a lot of things at the Baby Beach. So with that, just because I know from um, my own experience in town, we know that the harbor has a variety of different stakeholders. 
Board of Selectmen have their certain parcel trustees of the Bathing Beach, which would work better. So is there a support from all the entities? Uh, I mean, even the Maritime Center has are basically stakeholders down there. So do you get have you got support for a study from all of those stakeholders? Certainly the Maritime Trustees are, are aware, and, and we've been working closely with them on particularly the, um, the wharf resiliency efforts. Uh, they, and they are fully aware of their Chapter 91 responsibilities to have a pathway along along the harbor. Have I uh, gone to each of the stakeholders? I've certainly included. Selectmen are, are well aware of this and, and excited about it. Um, I've talked to the Historic, Historical Commission, Historic Districts Commission, in the context of the impact on particularly Town, town Pier, because that park is under their under their jurisdiction. So, uh, CONCOM, I know uh, Lonnie was here. Lonnie, as as you know, has approved each of the the walkway portions here to four. She's also approved the uh, the plan for the new parcel and the new walkway parcel in front of the bandstand. Um, as we get into don't, town pier, we'll, we'll probably need that. All of this, you know, again. You have a you have a vision, then you go and you, you you work on the funding and you work on the permitting. So we haven't we haven't gone to that extent, but it's 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 early. Okay, yeah, I think uh, what she's asking too is that when uh, when the updating of this plan is of the 07 plan is finished, yes, it'll get socialized in the way everything else gets socialized around town. Well, it'll be socialized before it's finished. Yeah. That's that's my point. The process is you include the stakeholders yeah. in yeah. the development of the effort, and that's yes. so that's we do all of that, and then Presley or whoever you go with is comes up with the final plan, and then before you start chipping away and doing some of the components of that plan, all of that is like all of that town, is shared. Everybody has to say yes. To yes. It. Like yes. Like everything else. Yeah. Okay. Larry. Yeah. Yep. So, Bill, thank you for this. I think it is so neat. I, uh, the brick walkway is great, but when you're closer to the road, it is kind of uncomfortable and mishmashy, and it would be terrific to make it uniform and mm -hmm. more user-friendly. So that's a good thing. My concern is with Presley's proposal. Mm -hmm. They are asking for $60,000, and they've given five numbers, and I don't feel there's a deep enough dive to really understand how they're going to use the time to arrive at these numbers, what the cost per hours are. Everything is in months, five months for an initial draft, three months for a later draft, but how much time in those drafts? And I kind of feel like if I were having something done, I would need much more information before I committed to, to the price. And, you know, um, if, if this moves forward and, and goes to town meeting and the town votes yes, I, I think they need, we need more information to make a recommendation about, well, exactly how is the money being spent in these ways? I, I looked at task four because it was the only one I could make believe I could wrap my head around in terms of time, and I looked at how many meetings and how many site walks, and I thought, well, maybe 30 hours altogether, that would be $333 an hour. Maybe 40 hours altogether, that would be $250 an hour. And maybe the numbers are exactly right. Maybe it takes X many people at this many levels to get this thing set up. Maybe this is a very reasonable number, $60,000. But I think we just can't tell from this. I, I think they have to sharpen their pencils, and, and you have to hold them to it better and, and just... We need to understand better what these five numbers entail. So two things. Uh, two things I would uh, respond to that, or two ways that I would respond to that. You know, one, when I originally contemplated, hey, there's an opportunity, and it's it's time for all the reasons that we've mentioned. And I think, I think there's consensus on that. I went to Presley in part because I, I had been working with them a little bit because of the other, the other effort. And I said... You know, I first I need a, a ballpark here. You know, what what's the order of magnitude? And I knew what the the 2007 study cost. It was 62.5. So that's 11 years ago. So and I knew I wanted to do a very similar process in terms of uh, 
stakeholder involvement, meetings, you know, all of that, because it's the only way it works in this town. You're not going to get buy-in if we if we don't do that. So that was one, you know, one test test point. You know, I made it clear to Presley that look, I, I, I needed this in order to file an application. If um, this grant were approved, I would have to do something. I've talked to Roger a little bit in terms of well, where are we on from a from a government, you know, contract point of view. His perspective was this is this is this is not for for personal service work like this. You don't do, you know, a, a competitive bid in the same way that you would for a structure. Uh, you probably do at least consider some other alternatives. So there's there's the question of how do you how do you sequence that? I, I guess in my mind, Larry, do you you know do you go back um, and ask for that kind of detail uh, now from Presley? Um, it, but knowing that they, they may not be, you know, the, the ultimate bidder. Um, I can certainly have them flesh out for me their experience in terms of the tasks. By the way, their number was originally about $10,000 higher, and I, you know, worked on it to get it down to a level that was consistent with what I felt was appropriate given the earlier and as it happens, the number that I put in the uh, in the preliminary application. Uh, I guess what I'm okay. So we're mid November. The next yes. uh, opportunity for you and to come to talk to us is early January. Mm -hmm. I don't know how. I don't know if you're going to get bids from other companies or not. Oh, I hear what Roger's saying. It's not a bad idea to look. But what whatever you do. It, it really strengthens the application and to, to flesh, that, flesh that out a little bit. And and whatever other app and whatever whatever other proposals might come in, I would say flesh it out kind of considerably more because a number of months just doesn't tell us how the manpower is going to be spent. And I'm glad you got them down ten thousand. You might be able to get them down considerably more once the pencils are really sharp and feasibility studies. Or a funny thing, and all kinds of numbers are thrown up. It would put us in a, and it would make it easier for us to deliberate, really, with a good, serious eye. If we had better numbers, I agree with that. But I also, um, as a someone for 29 years who was a personal service provider, uh, in, in a consulting kind of mode, and you you estimate you use your experience you, you have a sense for uh, levels levels of effort I can ask them to flesh that out um, I'm remembering a, a, a contractor I was working with on a project in Maine and he he gave me one number and that was it and I didn't I didn't work with him because he wasn't willing to work with me in terms of well how'd you how'd you get there what are the what are the pieces and I was I was asking him to do the same kinds of things that you're doing and I you know, I'm certainly Willing and, and uh, able to go back to Presley, work work on that. Whether I could reach out to other bidders at this juncture, given we, we may have a project, we may not. It's 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 a little it's a little tough. It's your call. Yeah, I'm just expressing my concern. Okay, yeah. understand. Any other questions? Jim Watson. Yeah, I'm looking more narrowly for this question. You mentioned the raising of the. Heights of the wharves against the up to three foot coastal sea rise. I assume that that's continuous, so that there aren't low spots between these improvements. Jim, uh, you've I'm trying to think whether you've been in on some of the sessions I've had with the selectmen and/or the um, advisory committee. We have to be opportunistic on this question of sea level rise and resiliency. We we needed to work on the wharves because they're they're in, in bad condition. At the same time, we had the Kleinfelder study that we need that, that said we really need to address, you know, the weak Probably. spots. The, the, the wharves are weak spots, and they are low spots. They are some of the lowest spots in town, but they were they are not all of them. And some of the the issue of sea level rise for the for the town is going to have to be temporary, where you may put up Jersey barriers that some 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 towns post Hurricane Sandy down in New York and New Jersey. Looking hard at you know, on short notice, if you've got a storm that's coming up the coast and you know it's three or four days out, but it's heading for us, what can, what can you do for the spots that you don't you haven't done permanent work on? 
once we've done the three wharves that I'm talking about, we will have significantly reduced, but there will still be some holes, and those will have to be filled by, by temporary measures and or by later. Um, the sea level rise issue is a, a 10, 15, 20, 30 year kind of horizon. Well, that's, that's what I was hoping to hear, because I kept reading about raising this, raising this, raising this. And it's it's not all. They weren't paying attention to the. To the we we know about gaps, them, but yeah. you, you, some of some of them are not even you know within our control. Well, I think all of this is what makes the the hollow winter construction proposal so tempting yes. because it precludes lots of those spots, big problems. But anyway, thank you. That's what I was hoping you would say. Thank you thank so you, much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bill. That was a good presentation. I'll, I'll just close out by um, I was an exchange student to Japan to a school. Uh, founded by a, a wonderful educator, and he was a calligrapher as well. And the symbol of the school was this wonderful piece of calligraphy, a, a version of which I made, carved when I was there at 17. And I brought it home, and I asked uh, the man who's now deceased, but his grandson is running the university now, and I said, what does that mean? And he, and he said, no vision, the people perish. We need a vision. That, that's, my, that's my message. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. I it's been a long night. To adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Hi. Good night. Same time.